2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. GL Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Great Barrington Select Board will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and our parties with a right and a requirement to attend the meeting can be found on the town's website. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to listen to the meeting may do so following the instructions at the top of the agenda. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we're unable to do so despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Pursuant to MGL 7C 3820F, after notifying the chair of the public body, any person may make a video or audio recording of an open session of a meeting of a public body or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Beginning of the meeting, meeting the chair shall inform other attendees of any such recordings. So the town is re recording this, CTSB is, as tradition, the uh, Berkshire Edge is recording it as other people may be. Any member of the public wishing to speak at the meeting must receive permission of the chair. The listing of agenda items are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. First, we have approval of minutes of June 11th and June 23rd. Uh, motion to approve both. Second. I have a motion by <coughs> add a second by Lee. Discussion. A roll call vote is all roll call. All votes will be Lee. Aye. Kate. Aye. Bill. Aye. Ed. Aye. And I. And that also gives us a roll call that all members are present. Select board's announcements and statements. Lee. Nothing. Kate. I don't have anything. Bill. No, nothing. Ed, nothing. And I have nothing this evening. Town manager's report. Thanks, Steve. I have just two brief updates for you tonight. Uh, first is, uh, as promised, I reviewed the contracts for ACOM and DPC Engineering for the Phase Two study and appraisal of the Houstonic Waterworks uh, infrastructure. I also signed those agreements, and we expect that the work will take roughly four months to complete. Uh, once we do have a report from these two engineering firms, we'll, of course, uh, bring that back to share it with this board and notify the Housatonic residents uh, so that they can participate in the discussion and the presentation. Uh, just know that my updates for the next four months will be limited to uh, DEP issues since we'll uh, have to give them time to do the work. Uh, I also wanted to mention that our parking ban is now in full effect until March 31st. Uh, what that means is that parking is not permitted on town streets between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, and the uh, Great Barrington Police Department did share this information on their Facebook page. They shared it with our local media outlets, and also uh, we shared it on our town Facebook page. So the word is out. And I have one last add-on that's not on the agenda for town manager announcements tonight, and that's that we received the resignation uh, from the or from the Houstonic, uh, sorry, the Great Barrington Housing Authority. Um, so we have an opening for a seat on that board that will remain open until uh, an appointment is made uh, and that will carry uh, through the next election. So if anyone out there is uh, interested in serving in this capacity, please contact my office with an email or a letter of interest. And in the meantime, we'll be advertising that uh, more widely on uh, Facebook and our website. And that's all I have. Thank you. Licenses or permits. Laura Stephen for a driveway permit at 23 Summer Street. If anyone's here representing the applicant, they can raise their hand. I don't know that it's going to be necessary. Jim Waldman, perfect. So you have been, you just need to unmute yourself. I, I am now, thank you. Yes. Uh, does anyone from the board have any questions? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Motion to approve. And a second. 
So I have a motion by Ed, a second by Bill. Any discussion? <coughs> Roll call vote, Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Waldman. Thank you. Temporary lifting time limits on downtown parking. Do you want me to talk about this since I was the one that mentioned it? Sure. Um, I was just thinking last year we had been approached by Mahawi, um to lift parking restrictions. I think it was even just certain days of the week. Um, and we made a decision as a board to lift the parking time limit restrictions um, through the holiday season, as we thought it might help promote people to come down and shop at businesses downtown or stay longer. And I just think given the current situation that a lot of our small businesses find themselves in, I think anything we could do to promote people coming downtown to buy their Christmas presents safely or holiday gifts in town um, would be great. So I'm hoping that we can repeat what we did last year. Do I, do I have a motion? You want to make it, Kate? Uh, you, you, you can make it. <laughs> uh, it was now through the end of the year. A motion to waive the hourly parking. The, the, just the time limits. The two-hour time limit um, from now through the end of the calendar year. Oh. Second. So I have a motion by Ed, a second by Kate. Discussion? Roll call, Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And aye, it's unanimous. Thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appointment <coughs> to the Cultural Council. Milena Cerna, Stacey Ostrow, and Sherry Steiner. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve Milena Cerna, Stacey Ostrow, and Sherry Steiner. A motion to, I'm sorry, appoint the three of them to the Cultural Council. Uh, second. Any discussion? Roll call, Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. Um, I'm not sure if any of the three want to speak. I, you're, you're glad to. You have been appointed. Uh, fine applicants, so there are really no, no problems. I don't see anyone with their hand up, so I will move ahead. Review and comment to the building inspector per zoning section 9.3.11 on the building permit application for new singular wireless PCS LLC, AT&T, for a collocation of equipment at the existing wireless telecommunications tower located at 425 Stockbridge Road. Chris, are you going to give us a brief explanation of this? I have a feeling this is not complicated. We have to approve it. We have to make a recommendation to approve. Hi, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sure, and uh, the applicant may also be on the line, Steve. Uh, Allison Hebel. Uh, yes. Be, sorry? Yes, I do see you. Um, okay. Uh, yes, this is relatively straightforward. As uh, our bylaw provides a 30-day review period for uh, applications at existing permitted cellular tower uh, facilities, and AT&T here is is proposing to uh, replace some of its equipment out there at the tower behind uh, WSBS. And um, let's see, the planning board met about this last week and just had a fairly administrative comment. Uh, typically, the planning board's review revolves around the radio frequency emissions report, and it was satisfied with this particular report. Um, but I'm sure the applicant can answer any questions you may have. Questions from the board? Allison, do you have anything you want to say before we take a vote? I do not. Um, if, just if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Seeing no questions, do I have a motion? Yeah, can the motion be to send this to the um, building inspector with no objections? Yes, that would be fine. Okay, that's the motion. And I'll second it. So I have a motion by Ed, a second by Bill. Any other discussion? Roll call, Lee? Aye. Kate? 
Sorry, aye. Bill, aye. Chad? Aye. And aye, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Chief Walsh, policy, a police reimagination review of policies. Hear me okay? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Our, our, goal, to, our goal tonight is to um, show you and everybody what um, we believe is at least our first attempt at police reimagination in, in our department. Um, I stress that it's, it's not 100%, but we think that what we're going to show you is that we're off to a good start, and we want to share some of that, as obviously these issues have been raging across the country for uh, quite some, some time now. Again, it's not 100%. It's not everything. There's still work to do. But we did want to start and tackle some of the uh, the issues. Um, there's three documents that I want to stress that we took these topics from tonight, or action items as I call them. Uh, there's three documents that we're using, and all the slides and topics that we're going to show you tonight. And the, the first one is in front of you. It's from the United States Conference of Mayors. It's their report on police reform and racial justice. Uh, it just came out in August, so it's brand new, it's fresh, it's, it's uh, right off the press, and has a lot of good ideas in that. The other two documents that we took the work on uh, in the past few months uh, are the uh, two reform police reform bills in front of the Massachusetts legislature. Um, one's the House bill, and one's the, uh, the, uh, the Senate bill. And as you know, right now, they seem to have stalled in a, a conference committee where they're trying to come up with a compromise and come out with one final, final bill to uh, you know, present to the governor and have him sign off on. And no one knows when that will happen, but uh, you know, because a lot of these topics we talk about tonight, all these topics we're going to talk about tonight are on both versions of the Senate bill and the House bill. Uh, we felt that we were safe to go ahead and start working on them, and we feel confident they'll be in the final bill. And rather than wait, you know, for that to happen and <laughs> wait for a governor to uh, come out and tell us, here's what you have to do. We want to continue to be ahead of things here in Great Barrington and have a lot of these issues already completed. Uh, we can always go back and tweak it or revise it, but we're pretty confident um, the topics we'll talk about, um, the issues that the whole country is dealing with, and we're pretty sure the governor is going to have that on his final bill. So those are the three documents we're looking at tonight, and I just wanted to you know, frame some reference for you before we continue. Um, the Conference of Mayors document, uh, this is their front page. And if you look at it, um, to our credit, I guess, we're doing most of these things that they're suggesting or recommending that they just came out with in, in August. If you look through that list um, from trust and uh, legitimacy, that's one of the 21st you know, uh, pillars of 21st century policing we've been working on for a long, long time. Uh, we just recently, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, made many of our policies available to the public on our website. That's one of the recommendations. Um, redefine the police role. The adopting a co-responder model. We all know we did that quite some time ago with the partnership with the Breen Center, and that collaboration. And that's one of the big things that they want police departments to be doing. We've been doing that for a while and in front of it. And uh, that's been working really, really, really well. Use of force. That's the policy we've gone through. And we're going to be talking about a lot tonight uh, that we've revised. And we're going to 
you know, let you know what we've what we've done. The duty to intervene, uh, providing first aid, de-escalation, crisis intervention. We're going to talk about those further in a little bit. But those are all topics that the mayor's conference is saying police departments should be up and out in front of. And um, we, we're doing that. Uh, equality and due process, impartial policing. We're going to be talking about that a little bit. And uh, hiring, promotion, and retention. We've done a little bit in that area. So we're out in front of a lot of these topics that just came out in August from this, uh, you know, it's a major player, this group, uh, the mayors. And uh, we, we think we've done a lot of work in those areas, okay? Just in trying to go in some sort of order, um, one of the things I, I just mentioned was that uh, more and more police departments are putting um, a sample of their policies out on their websites. So we've done that. I think we've got about 30, I want to say. I might be off by a little bit of, uh, of our policies out there. They're on our website. It's uh, earmarked under a category. You, know, you can't miss it, policies and procedures. And again, the idea is all about transparency and accountability, which is what people are, are looking for, and, and understandably. And um, you know, a lot of you know, criminal justice reform initiative is putting these policies out there. You know, um, some policies you, you can't. I mean, for obvious reason, some policies are, as, as I say, it, top secret. But you know, um, but there's a lot of policies that we can put out there, and there's no downside to it. It's all positive putting some things out there that the public can see, and just uh, you know, some of the rules and uh, regulations that. Uh, we operate under. Uh, as time goes forward, we're going to look at a bunch more and put a bunch more out there. But our first initial step uh, within the past two weeks, I think uh, we put about 30 out there. And our portal, uh, portal is a section of our website. And under that GP portal, there's just tons of information that we invite people to, to, to look at. There's all sorts of data, uh, statistics, um, uh, you know, our community policing programs and a lot of it's part of uh, the 21st century policing ideas. But if you're looking for transparency and data statistics, statistics, I'm sorry, there's just tons of stuff under our portal as far as use of force, you know, uh, tasers, our weapons, when we use them, um, things like that that people are looking for more and more now. We're getting requests all the time for information on that data, and, and we posted it. Um, hate crimes information, it's all out there, our community policing activities. And uh, again, we encourage people to look at that. There's lots of stuff on there that, you know, you know there's, there's no deep, dark secrets here. There's lots of stuff out there that we want people to know we're doing. Our use of force policy, which is what we're talking about uh, a lot tonight, uh, um, is what we're going to spend a couple of minutes on if we could. Um, these are all major topics um, <laughs> the whole country has been talking on, and we want to address them in our policy, and again, not wait for people to tell us you got to do it. Uh, uh, they're good ideas. We agree with them. So we've gone ahead, and uh, these are actually in our use of force policy that we revised and just recently reissued to all the officers, and I would gladly give you, you know, uh, a copy of that, and you'll see each of these items in there. The duty to intervene, big topic across the country. Basically, if, you know, if an officer is seeing misconduct being done by another officer, uh, this requires them to uh, to intervene, take some action to, uh, to, to stop the behavior, to correct it, to, um, you know, get between the officer and the suspect, you know, it's, it's you know, the George Floyd incident where, you know, uh, some other officers stood by. So that's where it all comes from. It's a, it's a good idea. Uh, it's it's going to be in the new law. So we put it right in our policy. We've given our officers uh, two classes on that. And, um, and that's what it's all about. It's, you know, intervene if you see another officer doing something that, he shouldn't do. And if you looked at language or a policy, it requires them to report to supervisors to make out reports. And 
It's not something that's going to be able to be, you know, swept under the, the, the carpet, which is a good thing. De-escalation training, um, we've done a few classes on that already. There's going to be another class in the in-service um, fiscal year 21, which begins after Christmas. Our in-service training for this year, FY21, uh, begins after Christmas. And, and that um, it's trained by the Municipal Police Training Council and um, one of the mandatory classes for all officers across the state is going to be on de-escalation training. In addition to that, we provided our own officers some uh, other articles on that. And, uh, you know, we think we've gotten that concept across to our, our officers. Rendering aid after use of force. The idea is, is that if you use use of force on a suspect, you know, you can't just stand around and not give a medical aid or attention. And, and um, our policy says, you know, you're duty bound uh, to give aid after you've used some type of use of force. It's not just a weapon, it's a baton, it's a mace, it's taser, uh, anything that's a use of force, you have to render first aid to, to you know, that, that, that subject. And that's gonna be required by law too, I think, in the, in the new bill. Drawing aim your firearm, um, that's one of those objects that uh, the theory behind it is that when an officer draws and points his weapon at somebody, uh, that's a use of force. And they want departments to count that as a use of force versus saying that a use of force is only when you actually fire the weapon, you know? So now they want to count, just to get an idea and transparency, how many times police are actually pulling that you know, gun from their, um, um, you know, their holster and not using that, but just pointing that because obviously that is kind of a use of force. And now we're required to keep data on that. So, um, so, so, pe so people know people are into this use of force by the departments and we want to be completely transparent about that. So that's something that's brand new. It's going to happen across the country and that's going to be in the new bill. Um, and we're giving our guys some training on that. The use of deadly force, we've given our officers uh, actually a couple classes on that. There'll be some in-service on that. And um, again, we've revised our policy and we've gone over it with our, our officers. So the use of force, I'm referring to our, uh, our policy. Uh, also wellness considerations, um, we're waiting for a possible grant in the, er in the area of I think $12,000 maybe, where we're gonna try to do some um, new, now the box training with our officers in terms of officer wellness and mental health checks and things like that. So it'll be kind of brown uh, groundbreaking if we get this grant. And um, you know, we, we we hope to hear on that pretty, pretty soon. The last item, which is a major item, is shooting from a motor vehicle. And uh um, you know, but there's been a lot of debate on that whether police should or could you ever, and it's banned in our policy, but there is one caveat that uh, it will be allowed in the bill if it's the last desperate attempt for an officer to protect his own life. In other words, you know, if he's exhausted all the other uses of force and you have that one in a million scenarios where he's in a cruiser and he's got to use the weapon, uh, you have to say it's okay in case that one in a million scenarios come up and the officer's down to uh, you know his own safety. And but 99.5% of the time shooting for a motor vehicle is prohibited. I just want to go to the top again. I think I skipped by show codes. Uh, our policy bans show codes, and again, except in situations where deadly force is allowed by law. So again, for all practical purposes. We're going to be able to say, yes, we banned show codes, but there could be that one time situation where an officer, you know, he's lost his weapon, he's lost his baton, he's lost his mace, he's got nothing else if he's on the ground wrestling with somebody. And the only thing he's got left to save his life is that he's got to grab someone, it's a choke hold. Again, that's permissible under use of deadly force. It's going to save an officer's life, and that's his last option, but, uh, you know, every other use of, you know, the tools we have have to be exhausted before you go to that. So for all practical purposes, we do ban uh, 
Shell calls. This is under training um, that we we some of it we've done, some of it we're currently doing, and some of it will be done in the future. Um, the crisis intervention training, uh, we've talked about that before with you. Um, we've done a lot of that with um, the Breen Center and all officers have had 40 hours of that training, which covers de-escalation and, and, and everything. So we've already done a lot of that and we've reported that to you before. Before, so that's not a brand new thing for us. Um, so, so that's a good thing. We are doing a lot with the uh, the Breen Center, um, the One Mind campaign that all ties into it, and um, implicit bias training. Again, that will be uh, in an in-service class coming up right after Christmas. Hate crimes training. Um, all the officers have had a, a roll call video. In uh, Massachusetts, it's put on by the Mass Chiefs of Police Association. Uh, it's a roll call video training on, on hate crimes. Basically, it's a, a refresher to go over your policies, and all the officers have done that. Uh, diversity awareness training It's another class we've given our officers. Uh, it's kind of self explanatory. Uh, there's lots of good stuff in that. All the officers have had that. Uh, by state law, every department needs to designate somebody as a civil rights officer. We have to name that person and turn it into the state. I think it's EOPS that collects that information. And previously, this was myself. And but we had a class that came up a couple of weeks ago, and I sent Sergeant Scalato a story to that class. And um, so now they're designated through the state as our two official uh, Massachusetts civil rights officers uh, for police departments. And part of their role is to come back with that training. And, you know, we're going to pass it on to the, uh, the uh, police officers. We've had a class on bias in policing and traffic stops. A lot of issues with that across the country. And, um, you know, we schooled and trained on, uh, on that. And uh, I, or I mentioned before the duty to intervene. The next slides are just the two certificates that Sergeants Collado and Storty um, had from that class. Just to show you that they took it. And they took that November 2nd. Again, fresh and, you know, right off the press, we, we, we took that. Um, quickly, um, procedural justice. That'll be, uh, well, we had that back in 2018. I just threw this on there real quickly to show you that some of these classes we've already had in the past year or two, it's not all brand new stuff, you know. We had another one in the integrating communication assessment in 2019. And that's a fancy title for de-escalation. You know, how to talk to people in a mental health crisis, um, uh, de-escalation tactics, um, um, uh, judo video, um, you know, judo techniques with your mouth, not actually hitting people, you know, judy, uh, judo techniques well, with your mouth and talking people down and talking them into, you know, coming along. And so that's a fancy name for de-escalation to enter creating communication. A refugee and immigrants, um, we've done some work in that area, had some classes on it. And again, we've done lots of stuff with interaction with mental illness. And that's just one example of 2019. Um, quickly, under the Massachusetts um, um, EAP site, there's all sorts of information that we just bring people attention to. Um, crime stats that we're required to report to the FBI. We're required to report to the FBI. A whole lot of uh, data and stats on crime in Great Barrington. And it's all on there. Um, if you can't find the link, cause will love to show it to you, but it's got all sorts of information on there on Great Barrington and the crimes that happen in Great Barrington. The police paints a picture that, you know, it's uh, it's pretty accurate. We got a report to the FBI and there's no fooling around with it, but um, it gives you a good look at, you know, exactly what uh, the, the crime picture in Great Barrington. Um, one other thing, uh, a lot of these incidents across the country, obviously, there's been some criticism about how police have handled it and tactics. And in all the professional literature I read, one thing they're 
recommend is that departments, you know, take some type of crowd incident management classes or literature and uh, brush up on their policies. So recently there was a class back in October. And again, I sent the two sergeants to the class and that's the purpose of this is, you know, it's a little bit, little bit different. So I want to tell you, you know, why it's up there, it's why it's part of police reform, you know, uh, you know, we're not going to have problems in Great Barrington, but obviously some places add the tactics and we've got this covered now. Um, one other thing is that uh, we talk a lot about, and I know in spring at the meeting, we talked about, you know, the hiring process, the recruiting and developing new police officers and the difficulties. So uh, we've got a lot more work to do in that area. But as a starter, we took some basic information from the civil service website and put it on our website. Uh, it's called How to Hire, Be a Police Officer in, Great Bar in, in Massachusetts. And that's good information um, you know, what's required in the civil service. So we just cut and paste that, but we've still got a lot, we've still a lot of work we want to do in terms of hiring and recruiting police officers uh, in the days ahead. Uh, one topic, the bill is going to call for, it's going to require every police department in, in uh, the state to be accredited. That's in both versions now, we think it's going to pass and every state will be required to have this. As you know, we're still the first and only in Berkshire County. We've been doing it for a while, so we've been way ahead of the curve on this thing. And uh, that's why this is in here. That's a coming trend that everybody else is going to have to do. Okay, the last slide, the last slide is just to show you that this just came out a couple of days ago. Um, it's from the, from the federal government. And what it's saying is that in uh, future grants from, from the feds going forward, they're going to require that departments have two things in their policies. One is use of force policy revamped, gone over, and the other is um, ban on, on chokeholds. And they're going to, they're saying that as a requirement of certain future federal grants, they're going to have to have those two things in your in your in your policies. So we want to show you that. It just came out the 30th to show you that we've already done that. And the major thing they wanted to point out was that, you know, the feds have to use some organization to vet the policies because they don't know in every state if your policy is good or bad. So in Massachusetts, they're using the Police um, Commission on uh, Police Accreditation to vet those policies to make sure that they have those requirements. And um, if the Police Commission on State Accreditation says, uh, yeah, that town or city's Policies are good to go. Um, the feds will accept that. Obviously, we've been accredited, so we have no problem in in um, in that area. So, again, a lot of good things. It's a it's a start for us, and um, you know we're gonna have to do some more and retweak some things. But we don't want to wait for everybody else to uh, you know tell us to get started. We know what we're doing, and we thought it was good to get going. One final point, and then I'm done, is that this is not in the uh, uh, proposals, um, but I just want to touch upon it because it, it is important. And, and I'll just quickly, quickly say that um, uh, that, that point is uh, the uh, police and funding movement. And as we've seen in the recent elections, you know, a lot of folks who you know thought that was a good idea lost their seats, and now they kind of regret pushing that. And uh, there seems to be a, a shift in the population in terms of, uh, um, you know, that message and the support behind that. And, uh, you know, in terms of Great Barrington, we know it'd be terrible having one officer on the road by himself at three in the morning or three in the afternoon for that matter. But, you know, for that barroom fight, that domestic, um, uh, just, you know, the other day at Theory Wellness, have one officer handling that mess, it doesn't really work. So um, we thank the, you know, the, the uh, uh, town meeting support we got for that. And uh, we, you know, we're thinking maybe that movement is kind of passe now. And uh, but we'll still deal with it in the budget process, I'm sure. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Let's move ahead. Lee, do you have anything quickly to say? Uh, thank you, Chief. I just had one question. Um, 
I had a question about um, the presence of, of ICE agents, because I know in January of 2019, there was an incident on Main Street. So I was just wondering if there's any way to address some of the fear that's in um, with the immigrant community uh, regarding um, the presence of ICE agents in Great Barrington, and if there's if there's a way to dispel some of the, the rumors and how you um, how we're going to move ahead with that, because I, I just there's a lot of rumors and fear, and I just wanted to to have you address that, please. Yeah, a couple things. Uh, every month, my monthly report, you know, to Mark and to you guys, I put in a line item involvement with ICE, and I started doing that a long time ago. I just uh, gave Mark today October's month, and it says involvement with ICE none. So. I'm duly reporting that as a trust policy says, um, if we have involvement, I, I, I will let you guys know in those monthly reports. We haven't and, uh, since the last incident on Main Street. Okay, In terms of your question, though, um, uh, I, I think it's difficult. They, they are out there, and in all honesty, and maybe this is what you're getting to, Lee, uh, they have been around. They have been in some establishments recently, and that had totally nothing to do with us. They come in and do it. They realize that we're in it, we're a town that, you know, we're hands off with them. They don't tell us, bother us, and we have absolutely nothing to do with it. But they've been around recently in uh, a couple places, restaurants. And unfortunately, it carries your question, we can't do anything about that. I mean, they're unto themselves their own nation and a law enforcement agency, but they've been around. Maybe that's what you're hearing, but it does not involve my department. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, you know, I I, I absolutely um, thank you for that. And, you know, I'm just thinking of some outreach into the immigrant community just to remind them that, you know, the Great Barrington Police Department is hands off and, and they are uh, a safe, a safe uh, entity. So um, just putting that out there. So thank okay, you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Kate, go ahead. I have a couple of things. Um, Chief, do you think you could um, send us a copy of the updated use of force policy? I I couldn't see your presentation, and then I don't have it in my packet, so I'd like to be able to review it and compare it to the, the old one. Um, yes. And I was also curious as to what your anticipated effective date is for that, because I think that um, perhaps... Um, we we should maybe have more input as a board. So anticipating um, what? What your anticipated effective date for the new use of force policy? Because it needs to have um, select board um, input before it is it is finalized. And I don't. I mean, I think without being able to see it, I can't feel like I can give it my input. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll get to you tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. And again, it's not okay. It's not a so change. I think that the probably be we'll tweak it. And... Right. Um, I was just uh, um, just it, it'd be nice to to get a look at it. So if you can send me the updated version, that would be great. Um, okay. I think we should all be looking at it, and if we have any suggestions to send to the chief, we either come back here again as a group or send them individually, but a policy can't go into effect without the input of the board and it doesn't feel appropriate um, to not to not see it to give you input on it. So that's just what I have. Um, and then I see that our the hate crime policy is in here and I know that I've asked that we review that together with you. Um, and I just don't know if we're, I thought that we weren't doing that for a couple of weeks. Otherwise, I do have some questions about that if we are going to be visiting that this evening. We are not going to be visiting that this evening. We we do need to visit. Right. Which one's that? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just didn't get your last comment. But what did you think was inappropriate, Kate? I, I just didn't hear that. It just that the I just for for me I, I feel very strongly about us as a as a select board it is our responsibility the policies of the police department and to have input on that and so I would like to have a chance to look at it and for us to be able to give input before it goes into effect. Yeah, it's fine. Um, you know, one idea I have is that you know we're 
talking about policies is that the uh, the, uh, the the land policy, land on policy we had, uh, I thought was helpful. Uh, you know, it only came, you know, only did it a few times, but uh, mm-hmm. I think that's an ideal example of uh, you know maybe this is like one venue you know for questions and information to go back and forth right. between us and the board. Uh, I think that was the uh, idea behind that. Uh, you know, maybe it's worth taking a look at that. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, we we again we always run those markers access to all those policies. And uh, again, there's nothing top secret in terms of to the manager or the board of selectmen. That's all right. That's all up in Mark's office, and he has access to those. And, well, we have access to them on, on the website as well. And I actually, Mark just handed me his copy, which is from 2009. So it's definitely not updated, the copy that he has in his office. Um, but I just wanted to, um, exactly. the, I have the policy and procedural m- m- manual. Um, it's the most updated page in it is from 2009. Um, but I just wanted to um, make sure, I, I think this is more Chief Aruma for the select board um, to as we as we move forward as we continue to look at at moving more policing into the 21st century which your department is working really hard to do um, that we continue as a board to to be a part of that process because we have we don't have a strong chief position in Great Barrington, which does ultimately mean that the policy of the police department is on the shoulders of the select board we have input, we are responsible for that policy. And so we have to be sure that we feel comfortable with the policy that they have. Yeah, and that policy is currently in so place, Kate. That's just what I have to say. In all fairness to us, Sorry, that which policy pol- is currently in place. In fairness to us, there's a 30-day window use, of course. policies for review. They're on the, it's a program called AMPM, but it's the policy program that we use. And it is a 30-day, for any brand new policies, there's a 30 day window on there. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're have, they have access and town hall has access to them. And uh, that 30 day window is for them to be reviewed and for them. Yeah. So that process is in place right now. We, we don't, we don't, we don't go out on our own and just, you know, ramp things through, but uh, you know, maybe we just need to kind of take a look and refresh how that all works. And again, yeah. I think that liaison policies maybe might, might be just one way of doing that. Right. So we can talk about that in the Thank future. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. Much, much appreciated tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Public hearings. And while I've got you here, are we have 55 attendees and nine panelists. Special permit application from Berkshire Aviation Enterprises, Inc. for a, an aviation field in an R4 zone at 70 Agramont Plain Road, Great Barrington, for sections 3.1.4 E1 and 10.4 of the zoning bylaw, continued from August 10th, August 24th, September 14th, September 21st, October 5th, October 26th, and November 9th, 2020. Continued select board deliberation. Chris, do you want to start this off with anything, or David, or? Uh, sure, Steve. Hi, this is Chris. Uh, the board has in its packet tonight a revised uh, set of findings that is based on your discussion at the last uh, meeting, the last time you deliberated, uh, following the close of the hearing at the last meeting. So you have a, a red line version. Uh, there are some insertions there uh, responding to uh, some of the comments that Ed made during the meeting and uh, later shared with me uh, the actual text. Um, so I can make sure I had to type those correctly. There were a few comments from Lee about wanting to uh, be a little bit more specific about the location and context of the hangar, proposed hangar buildings, uh, and uh, a few other, uh, I think, small changes. Um, Town Council has sent me tonight a slightly revised version, uh, which has some mostly typos and um, small changes, capitalization, and, and some corrections, uh, but nothing changed in the substance there. And councils on this meeting as well, if you'd like to, uh, uh, if you'd like him to review those. But as it stands, I think it's in the board's hands now to continue its deliberations, ensure that these findings 
are, uh, you know, acceptable to you. Uh, and your action tonight probably will be to review this one last time. And if you agree, then to vote on the findings either as presented or as amended before moving on to voting on the special permit itself. So does anyone have any questions from the board on the revised findings of fact? I've got a few, they're mostly typos. I don't know if you want me to point them out here or, um, there are typos. not that many, but there, I probably should because some of them may be relevant. Okay, go ahead. Um, in the introduction is on page one, the second paragraph where you, this is, I guess, one of the ones you added for Lee is the dimensions. Isn't one of the hangers taller than 16 and a half feet? I thought one of them was, I don't remember the number 22, was it? Uh, I will, I will check right now. I think initially they said 15 and a half and 16 and a half, but then I think in the final one of the supplements, there was one that was taller. Just give me a second. To... Sure. While Chris is looking, I'll remind people that Kate has re recused herself in this special permit, so that's why she's not on the screen, just for the record. Yeah, Ed, you're correct. The the, uh, the one hanger uh, had a top of ridge elevation of 22 feet. All right. So of what? 22 feet, 6 inches. Point. So... 22 feet, six inches. Oh, 22 feet. Okay. Um, tell me when you're ready. So I, I, would, I would add that um, maximum, which is correct, that the maximum height of the tallest hanger is proposed to be 22 feet, six inches. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, on the B for general findings, um, the second paragraph. Um, we're now at 90.95 acres, um, but then later in the paragraph, um, there's one you didn't catch. In the, right in the middle, it says, or 8% of the 91.3 acre site. Yeah, uh, thanks. Council caught that for me as well in this version tonight, so we, we got that. I think, okay, I think that happens again later, but I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, page six. Um, the one that starts with proposed new hangers. Uh, that's just a typo. It's right, the six new hangar buildings, not hangers building. Yep, yep, got that. And we'll correct the height in the next paragraph as well again. Right. And then two paragraphs below that is the size again, 91.3 acre site, proposed new impervious. Yep, got it. Thanks. Um, the percentages don't change. The acreage is just slightly different right. based on the assessment record. Right. We just used one consistent record. Um, page 12, on the other hand, um, oh, you talk about new buyers. It is not reasonable to assume that future buyers, it's probably potential buyers. Future potential? Yeah, okay. in other words, it's, someone can be off put from buying. Um, Was that an or potential ed? Sorry. No, oh, you could say that. But would you, you could just say future potential buyers. It, that covers okay. them whether or not they buy. Okay. Um, in the last line. Uh, oh, I, there was just, where's the last line with? Last line of the whole thing. It, it, it was. No, I don't see it here. Um, it's, yeah, it's about fit in. 
page 12, the last line, am I on page 12? Yes, you are. The last line. Ooh, there was a conversion. All right, don't worry about it. Anything else, Ed? No. Anyone have anything else? I think I just had one one thing on the uh, section 10.4 findings on page 12. Um, I believe they do not outweigh the potential detriments. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, we, we had thought that ourselves. Okay, that's all. Uh, do I have a motion on the findings? Would be a motion to approve the, uh, hold on one second. Just maybe suggest, Ed, uh, I'm going to the page. Yes, and as amended. Um, Chris? Mr. Chairman, I, uh, Mr. Rembold may have been about to allude to this. If you would like, I can. It would probably take me three minutes to just run through the document to quickly point out those clerical adjustments. Uh, again, as uh, was stated, none of them is substantive, but if you feel that you want to have that on the record, uh, we can certainly do it. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So I, I've tried to just cross out now those that were already mentioned that um, I had communicated, but starting on the first page, second paragraph, third line, small p plans, and then uh, in the line just before the red editing text that would just read, will total 44,250 square feet. On the second page, first full paragraph, fourth line, insert zoning bylaw before sections 10.4 and 10.5. And in the subsequent line, just insert uh, A before photometric. <laughs> In the next paragraph, first line, insert the word bin before in continuous and insert the word that after 1920s and also insert the word that before Great Barrington in the second line. And then three paragraphs below the very last line, this is the paragraph beginning other relevant materials insert zoning bylaw before sections 7.2 and 9.2. On the next page, the first full paragraph, the fourth uh, line starting and in the next line with respect to the Board of Health, uh, particularly near the Green River. So just particularly and Green River are inserted and a comma after property right before that. <clears throat> and then moving on to the next page in item number one, uh, three lines from the bottom, uh, a comma after 2019 and just strike the word on. And then the third following paragraph in the third line, it would read, the applicant stated, it is open to limits. That was just a clarifying statement. On the next page, in the second paragraph under number three, in the third line, change was to were. And in the fourth paragraph, uh, in the second line, just uh, change uh, Fallon to gallon, 55 gallon drum. On to the next page, first full paragraph, second line at the end, just insert towns apostrophe S before master plan. And two paragraphs below, uh, again, before the red line text, the same edit as above, uh, will total 44,250 square feet. On page seven, uh, first paragraph in item C, it's just capitalizing zoning bylaw. And in the next paragraph, third line up from the bottom, 
just deleting the word applied. So it would read rather and then right into the quote. Now on page eight, in about the middle where it says finding relative to item one, in the third line, just insert the word B before generation at the end, uh, towards the end of the line. And in the following paragraph, in the fourth line, um, change plan to planes. And in the paragraph following that, in the third line, delete the word B before SKDG. And in the next line, insert impervious coverage after the word new. On page nine, uh, right before item number one uh, in paragraph E, in the first line, the board's considerations in relation to, insert the word to, T-O. In item number one, third paragraph, second line, just inserting a comma after the word similarly. On page 10, item number four, first, uh, Paragraph finding four in the third line, just inserting the word and after ZBA decision. And then at the very, what was the bottom of that page, there were in the last line, just some extra uh, period or ellipsis there after the phrase does not fit in. So that would be deleted. On page 11, First full paragraph, simply changing GB to Great Barrington and inserting uh, commas after the words neighbors and airport in that same first line. On page 12, in item number six, second paragraph, uh, just a dollar sign in the third line before 5,000. And in the third paragraph, the fourth line, insert the word V before airport. And the other items called out, uh, have, or the other items I had have been called out, so that does it. Thank you. Want the motion now? Uh, please. I uh, move to approve the findings of fact as amended for special permit application 909-20 as and referenced as exhibit A. A second. I have a motion by Ed, a second by Bill. Any discussion? Seeing none, it's a roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Ed? Aye. Bill? Aye. And aye. Next motion, please. In view of the approved findings of fact, I move to deny the special permit application 909-20 from Berkshire Aviation Enterprises, Inc. for an aviation field in the R4 zone at 70 Egremont Plain Road. I'll second that as well. I have a motion by Ed. I have a second by Bill. Any discussion? So uh, real quickly, just to explain my thinking, um, you know, the criteria for granting a special permit requires um, that the we find that the adverse effects of the proposed use don't outweigh its beneficial impacts to the town or the neighborhood, which I think is important. Um, so if we're going through each of the six criteria individually and then taken as a whole, I did that. And on a couple of them, uh, particularly the environmental impacts and the neighborhood impacts, I, I, I felt the negative, um, the adverse impacts uh, far outweighed the positive and the others were either you know minimal or pretty close. Um, so, I, so that everything else is in the findings, but I just wanted to clarify that. Um, you know, there were plenty of objections from neighbors. There were also objections from a lot of people who didn't live nearby. Um, and the other, I guess, the other thing I want to mention is that the proposal is for us to confirm the status of what exists. 
um, so that the owners don't have to keep coming back to us and also for six hangers. Um, and that's what I was looking at those, those two things and considering the pros and the cons. That's all on that. One else. Surely this is one of the more complicated special permits that we've had to deal with. And I would agree with everything that Ed has pointed out. And I think for people who look at the vote as simply us being against the airport, they really need to delve in it further um, and really realize how complicated this special permit is after seven meetings. Um, very, it's very complicated. It's there's a lot of nuance in this, and um, it's it's not black and white. Anyone else? Seeing none, roll call vote, Lee? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. The permit is denied. Do we need to vote on 7.2? We, we do not, as far as I understand it, no. Next, we have a special permit application from Coastal Cultivars, LLC, 399 Boston Street, Boston, Mass., to locate a retail marijuana establishment at 454 Main Street, Great Barrington. Kate is back, yes. Um, closer than 200 feet to the property of a private school. The special permit application is filed for sections 7.18.4.3 and 10.4 of the zoning bylaw. This was continued from November 9, 2020 meeting. So do I have a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. Do I have someone on the line for an explanation of the project? Just raise your hand and you'll be recognized. Uh, I'm Peter Pusilowski on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and also on the line are Walter McTeague for the owner and Jared Glennon, Krishna Gandhi, and Pepe Breton on behalf of the applicant. We filed this special permit for the relief from the one provision that requires 200 foot separation between the nearest corner of the subject property and land on which a school exists. In this case, uh, the school is Dewey Academy. We're within the 200 feet because Dewey is on such an enormous piece of property. In fact, the school is more than 800 feet away. The building is more than 800 feet away uh, from coastal cultivars. Uh, this has become more unique because uh, at the be beginning of November, Dewey Academy purchased 27 acres in New Marlboro with the intention of moving there next summer. And we supplied you with the deeds and a letter from the head of school. Therefore, it's actually unlikely that we will need this special permit by the time we open, but we can't apply to the uh, CCC uh, until uh, we have all our local permits. And as of now, we require this permit because at the present point, Dewey Academy is uh, on the property uh, across the street. So I, I, I'm glad to answer questions. Uh, we're actually, asking for relief from something we probably won't need by the time we open, given the time that it takes the commission to approve a final license. But we need your indulgence now so that we can start the process. So let's have, um, see if anyone wants to speak in favor of opposi or opposition, and then we'll have board members uh, start to ask questions. So please raise your hand if you'd like to speak in favor or opposition. Trevor Forbes. Yeah, 
Yes, good evening, um, everybody. Trevor Forbes, 325 North Plain Road. And uh, thank you for, for opening this and for the work that everybody does on the um, select board. My concern with this is that if we have regulations in place, which some might actually argue are fairly lenient regulations compared to the um, the suggested uh, buffer zone from the Cannabis Control Commission itself in Massachusetts, then I think it basically presents um, a very bad precedent if we just basically say, well, for this particular instance, that's okay, that's fine, we'll just uh, ignore it. Um, Dewey Academy is still the school in residence in this particular instance. We have it on uh, Peter Pusilowski's uh, authority that they won't be by the time this, uh, this comes around. Uh, but who knows what else is going to be in that position at that stage. I do understand from another meeting and that came out of the planning board meeting that the Dewey Academy themselves may well have received some money from this particular entity, which really leads me to be rather concerned about big money marijuana basically influencing the decision making of uh, the select board. And I think it just sets a really bad uh, precedent. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. Michelle LeBaire. Uh, good evening, Michelle Lubert, 70 Division Street. I uh, agree with Mr. Forbes with regard to the select board establishing uh, a bad president, president's, uh, precedence with regard to granting this exception. Um, sitting in on other communities' meetings with regard to such businesses in their proximity to schools, generally it is the two the buffer zone which in many areas is 500 feet not 200 feet it's from the point you know the point of the property to the point of the property of the retail shop not where the building's located so i do think that the um, applicant's attorney is stretching that a bit already great barrington's 200 foot boundary is very generous and having been at meetings uh, for years, going to meetings, I see when um, a rule is bent once and tends to get bent over and over again. So I strong, I'm strongly opposed to the select board um, not complying with the 200 foot buffer zone. Again, this Commonwealth of Mass has a 500 foot buffer zone. So already the town of Great Barrington is quite generous with the 200 foot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bailey. Bailey, just unmute yourself, please. Your name and address. Yeah, there we go. Yep. I'd just like to reiterate James. Name and address, please. James Bailey, who's Tonic, Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, just like to re reiterate what the last two individuals said spoken on. I think it's a terrible precedent we'd be setting by allowing um, you know, consideration for this. And it's ridiculous that we're being told the school building is sitting in 800 feet away, whereas the property line's within 200 feet. Well, a, a rule is a rule, and it's not up to interpretation. A law is a law. Um, if we were to believe what the attorney for the applicant said, and that Dewey Academy is actually leaving, are we sure that another school isn't interested in moving into that building? Um, and if so, why would we even consider it until the move is even actually made? I mean, we're gonna take the word of an attorney 
Um, I just think that even to consider this application is going against everything that the board has the responsibility of standing up to. Thank you. Thank you. Denise, I assume it's Denise Forbes. Yes, Denise Forbes, 325 North Plain Road. <laughs> I just feel the same way the previous uh, people had said um, about Dewey Academy and the 200 buffer zone. We basically don't want to set a precedent, especially with all the different marijuana shops that are currently in the area already. It, it's just why, why do we need another one right next to a school, especially since we have Calix right on Main Street between two toy shops. So um, it, it's just, I really think we have to pull in the reins, take it, take a breather and stop with allowing all these shops to be on our main street. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. Ellen House. Ellen, go ahead, just unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, actually Jeffrey House, 99 Hilbert Road. Thank you, Jeff. Great Barrington. Um, I'm just uh, like, I'm concerned of where we're going with the uh, the marijuana facilities that we have in Great Barrington. I mean, I, I almost think about this as almost like what uh, North Dakota is like with when they start building oil fields all over the place in North Dakota because they found oil there. And, you know, it just seems like there's just too many facilities now and they just keep coming up and coming up. And I feel bad for Walter because I know that, um, you know, it's a property that he would probably like to get rid of. And these people have the money, obviously, to fork over. And then we're citizens and we have to make a statement and say, we have to make a stand and, and uh, you know, like come out against such, such a thing because we want, you know, it's a pot plant. You know, they want to sell marijuana there and you can drive 200 feet down the road and buy pot there one direction. You can drive 200 feet down the other direction and buy mm -hmm. pot there. And, you know, when is when are we going to say enough is enough? That's what I guess what I my you know, what I have to concern about. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak? May I make a brief rebuttal, Mr. Chairman? You may. Um, I think that the town has already spoken about the number of marijuana establishments uh, when it uh, turn down the proposition to limit the number. Uh, the town has spoken on that. Um, I think that uh, you're not taking my word for the fact that that uh, the school is moving. First of all, I sent the deeds. They've spent over a million dollars purchasing property in New Marlboro. And you have a letter from the head of school representing that. It's not my representation. I'd also like to point out that one of the other things that makes this unique is that this is the only proposal that Mr. McKeague has gotten for the building that did not involve demolishing it for a big box store. And if there's anything that, that uh, we'd love to see, it's that the building be preserved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So there are two people with their hands up. They've already spoken. Um, this isn't a debate, it's a give your opinion in, in favor or opposed. So I will quickly allow Mr. Forbes and Mr. Bailey to say something extremely quick because you've already spoken. So Mr. Forbes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. The point is, it's a, uh, it's a fact of precedent. We have a planning board that has uh, basically been um, prepared to go against the regulations that the town of Great Barrington has already put in place uh, at this particular point in time. This is rather like hanging up a, uh, a sign basically saying 
there are no regulations available for <coughs> planning in Great Barrington. Come and do whatever you want. That is the issue. Uh, I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Port. <coughs> Mr. Bailey? James Bailey, who's a tonic still, um, probably be here for a long time. So, uh, anyways, I, I'm just going to remind the board of your responsibility. You, you obviously took your time to do what you believe was due diligence in denying a uh, special permit for the airport. Um, you looked at that very, very, very closely. Um, I think that you need to look at this situation extremely closely and remember that you are elected by this community. You aren't elected by an attorney from out of state or out of town. You're not elected by a community or members of a other community who wish to make millions off of our town. You are elected and you're appointed to defend our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyone else want to speak before the board and then we'll close the public hearing? Possibly. Seeing no one, board members, do we have questions? I, I have a few. Go ahead, Ed. Um, <coughs> the, you know, the bylaw, which was voted on by two-thirds of the town, has this specific thing in it. We're not ignoring the bylaw by having this discussion. We are, for this, I think, very reason, there was something in there to allow us to make an exception to the 200-foot buffer. Um, in this case, it is 200 feet from property to property. I think it's 800 and something from door to door as the crow flies and you would have to actually be a crow because there's the big stone wall and then the uh, major road. Uh, I think it's 1700 feet if you were to walk um, the only way you can from one door to the other. So it's, it's really that, which is a longer walk than they are to Calix and many bars in downtown. Um, more to the point, the school is moving and they didn't have an objection even before they were moving. They weren't concerned. My biggest concern is the building isn't protected. First of all, I think the, the fact that the school there is all but moot because they're leaving. Um, the building's not protected and anyone else who buys it could tear it down. Um, and finally, I, I just want to, I guess Peter said it, but we're not weighing in here on the number of pot shops or the location of pot shops. All we're weighing at the town meeting did that already. All we're weighing in on is, is it too close to this school to uh, reasonably let them open? That's all. Please go ahead. So I've gone on record um, being against uh, not limiting uh, cannabis retailers. So that's that's been stated before. Um, in regard to this particular location, my questions are that if if we grant this permit and they move in there, who's to say that they're going to turn around and sell it? So we can say, yes, they're, they're, um, they're preserving this particular building, but that doesn't say it's in perpetuity. So that's a, that's a point that I'd like to make. Also, who's going to be moving into this, this old location of the school? Um, so is this going to stop another school moving in? And do we have any information about that? Um, you know, I, I do agree with some of the callers saying that there, it, it is a bad precedent, I believe. And when is enough enough? Uh, for me, I feel like it's, it's the Wild West and we're just letting things go a little bit too, too much, too far, um, too deep. We have, uh, you know, quite a few um, cannabis retailers and I haven't seen any evidence that, um, you know, box stores have wanted to come in. I've only heard... Um, uh, that being said, I, I, mean, I haven't actually seen any offers about box stores. So um, until I actually see that there was an offer for a box store that they wanted to tear it down, I, I'm questioning that. Um, I'm completely supportive of the Matiques, and I understand the uh, predicament that they're in. Um, but I definitely feel that precedent, we're setting a bad precedent, and that is enough is enough. So I'm, I'm against this. I don't see this as, as setting a precedent. This is a special situation, which is exactly what the special permit was meant to address. Um, you've got a property line that's close, but the buildings themselves are really far apart. But it's 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 a land, you know, it's a place that youth are are should feel safe. So whether it's door to door, I mean they have that um 
they have the environment around them to feel safe. So I, I don't buy the door to door. I mean, the reality, the, re the, the reason why they're there is to have that safe haven. So there's going to be students walking around. Um, so I don't buy the, the door to door at all. The only, the only thing we're dealing with is the distance. As far as a number, Ed is correct. As far as a number of stores, we had proposed seven at the town meeting. That could have been uh, amended to less, and the town meeting voted that down. So we cannot say there are too many stores. We can say it, but we can't use that as part of our, part of our judgment. We have every right to say it. But the distance is the concern. And I think the reason the special permit was allowed here is because the distance is unique. It's not 200 feet to the building. If it was 200 feet to the building, that would be problematic and not, not allowed at all. Um, and I wouldn't accept it, but I think there are two unique factors here. One is it's much farther building to building. And also, maybe I'm a trusting individual, but I think that this, we have all the documents that school is leaving possibly as early as next summer. They're not even going to get their permit before then, the way things have been going in Massachusetts for marijuana retail permits. And um, quite honestly, the that that's a beautiful building that many people don't see. And uh, I would rather see it be used for this than have it torn down. And that wasn't made as a threat by the McTeagues. Uh, I believe that was a fact. He's an honorable person. I don't think he would say that otherwise. Kate, did you want to say something? Yeah, I had a couple of things. I, I mean, I see that this is a, a there's a lease agreement in there. Am I under the wrong impression that the um, cultivators are going to be leasing the building and not purchasing it? So it'll still be owned by the McTeagues. Is that correct? You are correct. Okay. Um, and then my other question, I'm curious, and maybe this is more a question for Chris, um, knowing that that building doesn't have any historical preservation on it, I'm wondering what steps we can take to ensure that it does have some historical preservation on it. Um, and I don't know if that is something we can ask the applicant to do as part of this process, or if it's something that we as a town need to do or historical society needs to do. But, um, you know, this is a way to save the building for now, potentially. Um, but what are, what are we going to do going forward? This would be a big question. That's a big question for me. I would probably start with the historic district commission. Could I respond a bit? I, I spent 15 years on the Historic District Commission in Hingham, and I represented uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation for quite a long time when I was practicing in Boston. It is really tough to guarantee preservation of a building. If you put it on the National Register of Historic Places, all that means is that if it's demolished, the cost of demolition is not a deductible expense. If you put it in a historic district, uh, there's a demolition delay bylaw, but that only delays the process for six months. The only way you can, in fact, preserve a building is if the owner agrees to give you uh, a historic preservation restriction. And I haven't spoken to Mr. Matigue about that, but. Uh, that's not something you do overnight anyhow. Can I address that? Yes, sure. go ahead. Uh, it's Walter McTeague, uh, one of the owners of the building. Um, when, we, when we bought the building, it was in uh, severe need of restoration work. Uh, the building's actually a little bit older than uh, St. James, uh, I think 17 years older, and St. James had walls that were collapsing. Uh, when we bought the building, there was an engineer's report saying that the walls in our building were separated. And so we knew that. And we knew that we were uh, going to have to put a lot of money into saving this building, which we basically, not basically, we did entirely with our own funds. Uh, and, and thanks to the help of Lee Bank, um, we sought 
uh, historic preservation um, tax credits and so forth. And it would have been two years of um, making applications. And we decided we didn't, we couldn't afford to pay the mortgage and wait for that. So we did all of the restoration on our own and brought the building up to code because it was a change of uh, use from a church and it hadn't been improved for 90 years. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of cost. As everybody knows, it was basically double what we had hoped it would be. Uh, but we saved that building. We made it a beautiful, usable, viable building for our business, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, as many brick and mortar uh, retail businesses throughout the country are experiencing, uh, we couldn't survive. Um, and we were fortunate enough to close before the pandemic. Now we have this beautiful building that um, we don't have the ability to assign the rights for the historic preservation of this building because we have uh, uh, we have a mortgage on the building, and we've actually discussed this with the bank. It's not a possibility right now, so we don't we don't have the ability to do that. Um, but I will say that our intention always was to preserve that building and we we put our money into it and um, a lot of blood sweat and tears went into making that and preserving that as a beautiful landmark um, gateway to our village which you know I I uh, drive by on most days more than once and would hate to see a big box store there and I will say that um We've had two, uh, we've been contacted twice by big box developers and um, there has been otherwise almost no interest in that building other than this tenant, this proposed tenant. Please go, go ahead. So um, I, I absolutely um, thank you for doing that, Walter. And I think that's very, very important that we do preserve this. And for that reason, um, I'd like to ask, uh, I guess, Chris and Mark, if there's a way to have a condition that because um, the Matigues are holding on to this property, um, if we grant a special permit, that we have a condition that they do continue to preserve this um, since they're retaining ownership so that they do um, make the uh, the steps towards a historic preservation uh, restriction. They can't do that because it lowers the value of the building and the mortgage holder won't allow them to. Well, is there anything that we can do to hold them to this, that they're going to preserve it? Because my, my question is that we're, if we give them a special permit and the reason for that is to take it away from being demolished in the future, uh, I'd like to see some kind of condition that protects this. So there must be some way that, that we can ensure that this is going to stay this way and not flip in a few years back to a box tour once once the cannabis people move on. Chris? Uh, yes, this is Chris speaking. It, I think it's been, it's been said earlier that uh, the board's primary question here is regarding the distance to a school and whether it makes sense in this context to uh, allow a deviation from that distance requirement. If, if the question of Preserving the subject building um, is a key reason why you would vote in favor of granting the special permit. And you feel that it's, um, and you feel that there is some uh, reason to ensure that that benefit of historic preservation continues to, uh, is guaranteed to occur to the public over the long term or even perpetuity, then you would have to discuss that and work that into your findings so that it was a reasonable conclusion. But the historic preservation restriction of the building doesn't necessarily equate to the deviation of the 200 foot requirement. I hope I made myself clear. You can certainly go there if you find that historic preservation is, is, uh, is a key reason for this. I, guess I, should also, I should also note that the the subject site is in the village center overlay district, I believe, which um, has limitations on uh, demolitions and 
um, uh, you know, large alterations of existing uh, buildings. Um, and most, uh, you know, most of those things would require special permits from this board or maybe the planning board. Um, I think this board and uh, larger box stores, I think over 20,000 square feet, but I don't have the bylaw in front of me. Certain size box stores would also require special permits or in fact be prohibited. Um, so there are some zoning controls uh, that do exist on this property. Um, I, I hope that clarifies some things. So, I mean, for me, I, I would like to know um, the choices that we have, the options to to work in this into the special permit, because that that is an argument that I feel that is being made. That um, one of the reasons we should uh, approve the special permit is because they've had offers and box stores are going to demolish it. So, I think because that's part of their argument, I, I think that is um, a good reason why we can work this into our findings. And I would like to uh, explore a way to do that. So, Lee, I respond. To, go ahead, Peter. Let me respond first. Sure. My only concern, Lee, is that what they're saying is the only thing that they can do to preserve the building at this point is is this option. And if we put a permanent restriction on it, if we're allowed to, it really ties our hands. And what they could do is turn down the permit say, you know, withdraw and just sell the building and have it torn down immediately. But we just heard that they can't do that because of, it would come back to us because it's because it's in the village overlay district. So this whole thing about a box store doing that, we just said that we, I mean, is that true? They can't just come in there because it's in the village overlay district. So I, I feel like that that's a, Chris? I mean, there's, there's kind of an argument saying that someone's going to turn it down, yet we've just said that it's in the village overlay district and they can't turn it down and they can't demolish it. So I feel like I'm between two stools here. But just give me, give me a second. Uh, yeah, but Peter, uh, uh, sorry, Steve, go ahead if you want to move on briefly. Peter, go ahead. With sure. The, um, the, you the, can the, certainly put conditions on a special permit, but as you alluded to, the conditions only last as long as the special permit. So if in the future uh, the permit's abandoned or renounced, the conditions in that permit disappear also. So they don't regulate the use of the building beyond the use specified in the special permit. Just to clarify, the Village Center Overlay District reads as follows. Within the Village Center Overlay District, all proposed changes to the exterior structures, new construction, replacement of an existing structure, <coughs> and any substantial structural change shall require a review by the Design Advisory Committee and a special permit by the Select Board pursuant to Section 3. So now, um, I hope that, hope that clarifies this well. Um, may I ask a clarifying question about something that Peter just said? Yes. Um, he, so I think what he is alluding to is that this special permit would only really be necessary until the school leaves, in which case, if we were to put conditions on it, as soon as the school is gone, the special permit is mute. <laughs> But I just want to, as the as they're doing the same thing in that building, they're continuing to have the same use for the building. Um, I guess I just need some clarification as to to what that really means. Peter, just a clarification. What I took it to mean was, as long as the marijuana store was there, the restriction would be there. But as soon as the marijuana store left, assuming it did leave, that the restriction would go to it doesn't go with the property it goes with the use uh, i agree with your statement uh, this is this is chris typically special permits are written and recorded on the deed of the land and run with the land unless the select board makes a special permit condition otherwise limiting it to the applicant or limiting it in time so it runs with the land so it could it could stay with the building then correct that is 
exactly what I said. That's yeah. right. Unless so, the, the select board may condition it otherwise, limiting it in time or limiting it to the particular applicant or owner. So, I mean, for me, pres you know, preserving the building would be my number one um, desire. So, how that works into a condition, I would need. I think preserving the building is a desire of all of us, but that's not what we're being asked tonight. And well, if we are to turn, if we were to turn this permit down because they refuse to let us put a restriction on the building, we lose in court because that's not what this is about. This is about a 200 foot exemption. Um, we would all like the building to be preserved. They don't have the ability to promise to preserve it because um, their bank won't let them make that promise. Um, this isn't how we go about doing that. Uh, we could go to the Historic District Commission to start a process, but they're not, they can't uh, sign away the development rights of a building that they have a mortgage on. They can't do it. So if we were to put that restriction on, we're saying no to this permit. Uh, so why is that even part of the argument? Why are they saying that two box stores wanted to, dem you know, demolish it? I mean, why is that being brought into this? I mean, basically, if, if, if they don't use it for this use, that's another potential use. Um, Can I speak to that? Sure. Well, it's, it's Walter McTeague again. Um, the building is, was built. It was built in 1851 as a home for a doctor. Um, the Christian Science Church that had a very small congregation was able to use it for 90 years. When we took it over, we uh, were able to make what is very um, hard to use, broken up interior space um, with almost two foot thick stone walls that literally wrap into the interior of the building. Um, we were able to make it work for our use. This, the use by coastal cultivars, it's almost, it, it's almost exactly perfect for what their purposes are. They don't need to change anything. It's a, um, uh, a, a showroom that is, um, that has very protected entry, which was what we wanted with some additional offices and, and back office space. Almost no other uh, business uh, without a tremendous amount of interior renovation and even uh, breaking through of, of walls, which are historic, would um, uh, make it into a usable space for most commercial purposes. This is the feedback that we've had from having it on the market for uh, since April. So... Um, um, the, the, you know, what we're up against is that we don't have an, a business that is paying for, to maintain this historic property and pay the mortgage on it right now. And we need to, uh, consider, you know, what our options are. Uh, the last thing we want to do is, is, is we, and by the way, we did not approach the big box stores. They came after us. So, um, it's not a threat. It's just, you know, an option that we absolutely do not want to ha to uh, exercise. And here we have a solution to it. A, a user who is able to pay the rent and uh, have a very low impact on both the uh, appearance of the building and of the, uh, uh, you know, the overall uh, site and and it's perfect for them so well i had a question so I, I definitely absolutely appreciate that um what's what's the long-term view of this how long is the lease and uh what do you see moving ahead with this if uh, well, the real killer ends up leaving it's us a 10 year lease with two five-year options so it's it's quite long you know our hope is that it's quite long term that they're a successful uh, um, retailer and that that they stay and and keep the building vi you know vital and um, so are you saying that let's say after over four ten years if they break the lease are you um, committing to preserving the building or will you entertain 
the box stores at that point? Well, you know, I mean, quite honestly, Lee, in 10 years, we'll have less debt on it and we'll have a lot more options for trying to find the perfect user for that building. We love that building. We put we put our blood, sweat, and tears into that place. And you can tell from looking at it from the outside or from the inside, um, we want to preserve that building for ourselves and for for the community. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's a beautiful property. And for the right user, it could be perfect. For uh, most users, it's very difficult to use. We were very fortunate to have one user that came along that uh, that is perfect for. So, so once you stabilize um, your lease, I mean, is this something that you could uh, conceivably uh, approach in terms of um, putting historic preservation restriction on it? Absolutely. So is this something that we could get in writing or some commitment from you? Seeing that you're the owner? To the extent that that we uh, can, you know, given that we don't have uh, that, that without the, you know, there's two banks that finance it without their uh, signing off on it. We, we really don't have authority to do that, but it would certainly be our intention. Absolutely. I, I speak for my, my business partner, Tim, and myself wholeheartedly. The last thing in the world we would want to do is have that be a big box store. Everything about who we are as people and, and retailers in this community uh, and, and members of this community would speak to the fact that that is not what we would support for, for Great Barrington. So what I'm hearing is that you're, you're committed to preserving it. So whether, so is there something that we could get um, Chris or Mark? I mean, in terms of this special permit, I can or anything else. Well, I, uh, I, I think you've heard the the owner probably speak with as much authority he as he as he can, given given uh, the lender's position on the property. But uh, the board also discussed uh, conditions, time limited or or otherwise. Um, so again, if if if. Uh, Preservation of the building is a key part of your decision, and you wish to uh, secure that benefit uh, uh, for a certain period of time or in perpetuity, then you should discuss condition in that way. So I'm going to take a second here. There's some people who want to speak. We haven't closed the public hearing, so I'm going to allow them to speak. The rules are you can only speak once for three minutes. So I'm going to go first to Garfield. If someone else wants to speak and they've already spoken, I'll give you like 30 seconds, but um, not any longer. So Garfield, go ahead. You have not spoken. You just have to unmute yourself. Star six if you're on a phone. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I am going to follow up on a few others saying it would set a bad precedent. Um, if you do it for one, you have to do it for everyone. Um, I am really shocked that everyone's pulling their hair out and going nuts because we're talking about a big box store. I don't know why we're so displeased with that when we already have four or five marijuana shops, but everybody's, oh, great, that's lovely. Let's put another pot shop in. I have to agree with Lee. It's getting like the Wild West, and we have plenty. We have more than we need, more than this town needs to have. I voted for uh, the law for it to be legal, but if I had known that we are going to have one every time you turn around, uh, I, I wouldn't have done it. Um, the 200 feet is there for a reason. You have other shops that had to uh, abide by it, so um, why should they? Uh, again, with, I say the box store, and you, you might snicker, but uh, since we Kmart's gone, we have to either go online with our Great Barrington money or we have to send our Great Barrington money to Pittsfield or somewhere else to get the things we need. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a big box store in Great Barrington. And um, 
the other thing, why my last thought is, I guess, what concerns me. I'm very much into the town, into the citizens, into the people. This is an establishment that is not going to be for all the people, all the citizens of Great Barrington. It's going to be for the people that are over 18, I guess it is, and older. And so if it was something maybe more of a, maybe a socially conscious thing that was going up in that corner, I would be happy to think it should be endorsed. But to endorse a fourth or fifth pot shop and make it an exception, I don't think is needed when everyone else has to abide by it. And again, this is not something that we all can use. It's only for some. Thank you. Garfield, just state your address. And sure, I'm sorry. It's 107 Castle Hill Avenue, Great Barrington, Mass. Thank you, Garfield. Okay, very quickly, because um, Jeff? Uh, yeah, there was two things I'm wondering about. It, w what if it's in the reverse and let's say a school wanted to come into, let's say, where Trotters is and there was a pot shop there. How does that work with the 200 feet? Do you just deny the school because they're going to build a school within 200 feet of the pot shop or if, if the roles are reversed? Okay. What's your other question? And the other question is um, uh, when, when we're talking about the historic preservation of the building, um, it's my understanding that they're going to put a rotary in in front of that building, or they're going to take probably a third of the front of the, 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 is that right? So that's okay. nothing to do with this permit. So no, I know it doesn't, but I mean, when we talk about, we're sitting here for 20 minutes talking about preserving the building, but the state is going to go put a rotary in front of the building, thus taking away the, like the, you know, ambiance of what the building looks like up on the hill there. Yeah, but they're not taking a third of the land and that is nothing that we can consider. Um, well, I mean, it's something that you have to look at. I mean, is okay. that they are thank, doing thank something you. that right? Yeah. I mean, thank I'm you. not debating here. No, I, I understand. Town manager, you guys know what they're going to do with the rotary because they were out there this week surveying it out. So they're taking like 0.14 acre. I mean, it's uh, very, very tiny. Uh, they're, okay. they're, but what about the other opposite? Yeah, we'll answer that. Thing, we'll answer right? that, Jeff. Okay. We'll answer that. Okay. Chris, do you want to briefly answer that question? If the school was coming in next to a marijuana store? Yeah, it's pretty simple. A school could come in and locate next to a marijuana store. A marijuana store cannot locate closer than 200 feet to a pre-existing school unless a special permit is granted. Thank you, Chris. So it deals with pre-existing schools, not future schools. Michelle, go ahead briefly. Yes, uh, I just wanted to speak uh, back to the 200 foot buffer zone. Uh, if you look at the bylaw 7.18.4 under number two, uh, it states the distance in paragraph one is to be measured in a straight line from the nearest point of the property line of the proposed marijuana establishment and the nearest point of the property line of the protected uses stated above in paragraph one which would be a public, pre-existing public or private school. It doesn't say anything about door-to-door -door or making that exception. And again, right. I think this is a dangerous precedent. Secondly, I think we're setting another dangerous precedent in the fact we have an owner of a property who is lamenting that he has no other offers on his property and no other choice but to, to, do, to sell or lease to this particular business. What are you going to do in the future if some other owner of a building comes before you and says, I have no choice, I have no other offers on this building, I have to do a bed and breakfast, or I have to do this, or I have to make an apartment. So I'm just a little concerned that I'm seeing, it seems to me, and I'm going to say a little wheeling and dealing going on, and I don't particularly care for it. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, two more people are going to speak. Jim, I think this is your third time, so you have about 10 seconds. Jim Bailey? Yeah, um, just a couple quick things. First of all, 
200 feet is 200 feet. It doesn't matter whether it's to the doorway of the school or to the piece of the property. If the students can be on that 200 foot, within that 200 foot on that piece of property, it's no different than saying, okay, Monument Mountain's doorway is 200 feet away from the road. You know, come on, use use common sense. And second of all, if the five of you had been listening to what Mr. Rembold's been saying all along, the threat of a box store, the threat of a big box store is just that, a threat. Because the board has the final say in any big box store going into that area. It's a special permit process in that. So the threat of a big box store is just that, a threat. You people need to pay attention to what the town, man, town planner is saying to you right now. If you paid attention like I did, that's just a threat. So please, 200 feet is 200 feet. We're not going to dicker to door to door. That's ridiculous. The law is 200 feet. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, um, Denise Forbes. Hi, Denise Forbes, 325 North Plain Road. I just want to reiterate the whole thing is I think you're all getting off focus because the fact of the matter is it's all about the 200 foot property line, not the fact that the building is a historic property. And if Walter Mateague made an investment and it's going sour, that's not Great Barrington's fault or worry. He's a businessman. It's his business. He's got to figure out a way to do whatever he can to recoup the loss on that building. It's not up to Great Barrington to bail every person out who owns a business. What about the restaurants that have all gone out of business because of COVID? There's a lot more people out there suffering. And honestly, I would stick to the focus of the 200 foot uh, buffer zone and not the fact that it's a historic building, which it isn't. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. So before we close the public hearing, if we decide to close it tonight, let's focus back on the fact that the reason there's a special permit before us is because the zoning bylaws says 200 feet from property line to property line, and this doesn't meet that. So we either approve it with because of the reasons that both Mr. Um, Chilsky and Mr. McTeague have pointed out, and I'm not talking about the big box store, but because it's 500 more than 500 feet door to door, which is not what the zoning says, or because by the time this permit is in effect, the uh, school will have vacated, or for any other reason you would like. But that really is our focus tonight. Continue with the select board. Well, I mean, that, that's my point. I feel like that there's a lot of things that they're throwing in here. You know, it's the box stores, it's the, the schools leaving, you know, it's all muddling the fact that it's, it's against our bylaw right now. It's 200 feet. So you think of Monument Mountain High School, that's a campus. So we're not going to let someone, you know, pull across the street and put a, a cannabis retailer and say, oh, well, it's, it's, you know, the campus is so many acres and, and therefore it doesn't qualify. So, and we have to really just focus. This is a school and I don't care if they're moving. Another school might move in and we need to, to we need to stick to the, the bylaws. They're there for a reason. And, you know, we're, we're setting a, pre a bad precedent. I mean, we have enough stores here and I, I'm very, very sorry for the Matigues, but we really, really need to kind of, you know, put our feet in the sand and say enough is enough. So, you know, it, we have bylaws for a reason. It's a school, it's a school that has, um, you know, students in there that have difficulties with drugs and it's just, it's, it's just completely wrong. So I, I think that we just need to stick to what Steve said is 200 feet. It's in the bylaw right now and that's it. So also in the bylaw is the special permit process for waiving that in, the, in this case for all of the reasons that were given. Can I make a motion to close the public hearing? Uh, let me just recognize Mr. McTeague. Yes, you can. Unless someone on the board has something to say. Walt, do you have something to add? And then Kate. Well, I, I just want to add that uh, prior to the school uh, buying property and deciding to leave the, you know, where they are now, um, they had no issue with our application and they wrote a letter of support. And um, is that before or after they knew they were leaving? Pardon me? Was that before or after they knew they were leaving? Uh, well, it was before they, that we found out that they were leaving. So I don't know. 
So they, they obviously wouldn't have a problem with it if they knew where they were leaving. Well, yeah. Um, that's it. Okay, Kate? Is there anybody from the school here this evening? I think I was under the impression there was or was going to be. If there's anyone from the school, just raise your hand. Peter, do you know if anybody from the school is on the line? Uh, you know, one of the tough things about this webinar format is I can't tell who's on. Nope. You do nope. have two letters from the head of school, one saying he didn't have a problem with it before they were able to purchase property, and uh, the other uh, saying they are definitely moving. Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hand, Ed. Okay. Uh, unless the board objects, please, you can close the public hearing unless Chris tells me that's a bad idea. Uh, so moved. I'll second that. Can I have a, a question? Uh, am I allowed to say something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just with school administrators. So, you know, we, we've heard from these particular school administrators that we know they're leaving and they've said they don't have a problem with it. So that's a question for me anyways, because they're not going to have a problem with it because they're leaving. So I'm wondering any kind of school administrators, teachers, how they feel um, about this in general. So I, I just, I don't know if there's anyone out there. Um, you well, know, maybe someone, Railroad Street Youth Project. Uh, I'm just looking for someone that might shed some light into uh, making an exception on this 200 rule. I guess I have a motion on the floor to close the public hearing by add a second by bill. Further discussion? Roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I? So I have one suggestion for the findings if you want to do that. Uh, yes. Um, criterion six, potential fiscal impact, uh, that says that currently says the board finds the facility will not negatively impact town services and it will increase employment and maintain existing and taxable value in the property. I just want to add a sentence acknowledging that as a marijuana store, we get an additional tax that other retail doesn't pay, uh, 3% of, uh, sales. Do we need to put that in there? I don't think we've done that for additional for special permit. We haven't done a special permit for marijuana. We haven't yet. Right. I don't think so. I mean, it's one of the things to, it's one of the findings. Yeah. And looking at the pros and cons. Otherwise, they look fine to me. Anyone else want to talk about the findings? I mean, is there any place that we can say that it's against the current bylaws of the 200? Well, that's why they're getting a special permit. Uh, well, I know, but just to say that, because uh, in the criterion, there's no nowhere to say that. It probably does, right? I assume it's in the findings that they're too. Yeah, I think those. the findings state the, the, the distance. Yeah. It does, the, right in the first, sent, first paragraph under general. Do we know who's moving into that location? I think the building's for sale. We do not. Lee. How does that work if that's a school? Uh, any school moving in there would, if assuming this passes, would know there's a marijuana store across the street. And they don't have to get a special permit. Right. Same as if they moved anywhere else near a marijuana store. But if they didn't want one across the street? They wouldn't move into that building. I mean, it's the same. You, you know, any school, can, a school can go anywhere. That, we can't outlaw marijuana because a school might move in someday within 200 feet. It works the other way. I feel like we played this game with the school street building. We didn't want it to be a parking lot because we wanted to see what would happen with the building. And now there's no laundromat there and no apartments. I just don't think we can make decisions based on what can be. We have to make decisions about what's in front of us. And no, I was just—it was just a question. I wanted to get some information. They voted on whether to end the discussion, not. Um, uh. <laughs>
Okay. Who am I muting here? You're okay. muting Walt. Walt, we can hear what you just said. Okay. Um, can I make a motion on the findings? I'm trying to think if there's some way we can put in here that just a sentence that says that we strongly urge the owners of the building to continue to um, maintain the building in its historic nature. I mean, it, it's not going to be binding to anything, but I think it's important that the board puts that in there just so that when people look at the future special or this special permit, that they realize that's what was in the board's mind. Could we put in criterion for um, that he said he would do his best to, you know, that it's in his interest to do that or yeah. that neighborhood character if we put, um, I don't know how you would phrase it. This is Chris's job. Um, you know, applicant uh, says um, maintaining the historic nature of the building is a priority or something like this. Would that do it? Can we say for the duration of the special permit, isn't there something else that we can actually put that is a binding? The special, again, this special permit will run with the land permanently. We'll continue That's what I'm saying. You condition it otherwise. But can right. we hold it to the land then? I don't think Steve's looking for a condition. He's looking for a statement, right? I'm yeah. asking for a condition. What's that, I'm sorry? I was asking for a condition. But I, my problem with the condition is, as we've heard before, is that the applicant can't um, do that because of it, the loans and the banks. So I'm at least asking that we put something on here that recognizes that the board as a whole would like this building's character to be maintained in perpetuity. We can't force it. We could. We can't put it with a special permit. Um, and putting with a special permit, even if we can put it with a special permit, doesn't really mean much, because of course they're going to maintain the character of the building while the uh, store is there. It's what we're worried about is in the future if this lease ever ends and something, and they try to look for someone else to go in there. That's what we're really worried about. You can't put a condition on that the owner can't meet because he has obligations to the mortgage holders. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say, you said it more eloquently. Um, I get, what we want to say is that he what he said what he said and that impressed us. Right. Do that. But so after, on criterion four, after neighborhood character, I mean, it says that it would not alter the neighborhood character, can we say, and and continue to preserve the historic nature of the building or something along those lines and it says he wants to continue to yeah um, applicant states he wants to continue to maintain the historic nature of the building i think we can do that or this this use would help to yeah the board feels that this use would help to maintain the historic character of the building for at least the duration of this permit what did you get out of that chris I got that uh, last edition from Bill, so I have uh, Good one. the applicant states that this use will help maintain the historic character of the building, period. Or, not sure if that works yet. Bill, you are on fire tonight. <laughs> For the duration of this use. Now, Steve? Go ahead. We'll see what happens. Um, I move to approve the findings of fact for the special permit number 913-20 as amended and referenced as Exhibit A. I have a second. I have a motion by Ed, a second by Bill. Discussion by the board. Uh, it's a roll call vote. Lee? No. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed. Aye. And I. Was that five zero or four one? Four to one. Thank you. You want the next one? Please. I move in view of the approved findings of fact to approve special permit number 913-20. I will second. Motion by Ed, second by Bill. Any discussion? None. A roll call vote. Lee. No. Kate. 
Aye. Bill. Aye. Ed. Aye. And I. It's four to one. It's approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just point out that we have supplied all the information for the host community agreement. Might we get on your agenda for the next meeting to address that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Citizen speak time. Start with Mr. Forbes. Forbes 325 North Plain Road. Let me congratulate the, uh, well, these four members of the select board on basically being, uh, again, a sellout to big money marijuana. Um, there was clearly a lot of evidence presented to the uh, planning board that uh, the um, school had basically been bought out by Coastal prior to them sending in a support for this particular venture. Uh, I find it extraordinary that uh, we have a select board of four individuals who won't uh, stand up for the residents of uh, um, Great Barrington. And I'm frankly disappointed, uh, Mr. Bannon, given your position on the school board, that you have not supported um, the regulations of uh, the town of Great Barrington that you're supposed to be supporting yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Pedro? Hi, Pedro Pachano of uh, Five Abbey Hill. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we, had our dis when we had our joint meeting with the planning board, I brought before you a proposal for um, a, part a review of our parking situation in town. Yes. And I was wondering if the board has either moved on it or if there's any other action that's being taken with regards to the subject. But we haven't gotten to it yet. We will, Peter. I did read it. Yes. We, right. This hasn't gotten to an agenda yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Michelle? Um, Michelle LeVere, 70 Division Street. Uh, with uh, the last agenda item, several, several times it was referenced that citizens or the uh, voters, uh, they didn't uphold, hold a limit on retail shops, et cetera, et cetera. But what isn't said that citizens actually didn't get an opportunity to have a voice at our special town meeting. And I'm referencing uh, the citizens petition on um, our marijuana bylaws with regard to buffer zones and so much more. Unfortunately, a select board member adjourned the meeting before citizens really had an opportunity to be heard and to vote. So to say that the um, voice of the citizens had said, oh, we don't, we don't want to put a limit on it. Well, you didn't hear all the voices and you didn't see all the votes. And uh, so I, I get frustrated when I hear that. And um, unfortunately, we're silenced. Well, maybe not so much until May, but um, um, it, you didn't hear from all the voters at special town meeting. Thank you, Michelle. Mr. Bailey? Oh, God. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, also just chastise those four of you who uh, voted for this. It's absolutely ridiculous considering what you just went through at the airport. You sat there and you considered the detriments to that community or that immediate neighborhood and the community as a whole. You considered absolutely none of that in your vote tonight. Just you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You sold out to big marijuana tonight. And I'm telling you, that is a poor precedent you just set, period. Period. And I have one more thing completely off that subject. I'd just like to know who's responsible for the enforcement of uh, Governor Baker's travel ban here in the town of Great Barrington. It would be the Board of Health and the health agent, correct, Mark? 
Yes, be the board Correct. of health and the health agent. So who's been monitoring the uh, Theory Wellness or any of these hotels that still seem to have weekend visitors from New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Ohio, Kentucky? Hello? Has anybody Hello? checked the register of these hotels to ensure that they've been following proper uh, COVID protocol and theory wellness to ensure that they've been following proper uh, COVID protocol as well? I don't, I'll have to find the answer to that. I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Steve, but it seems to me as a simple citizen, if I can drive by theory on a Sunday morning, go to price chopper. And I notice on a Sunday morning, New Jersey, New York and Connecticut cars all lined up in theory wellness parking lot, as well as across the street at the hotel. Who's monitoring that? I mean, I'm not going to be able to see any of my family for Thanksgiving because of Charlie Baker's, uh, rules here, travel bans, but we're going to allow people to come into this community and purchase marijuana. I mean, let, let's get real here. If we're going to take a stand and really squash this COVID thing, we need to enforce all the rules. We can't just pick and choose which ones we want to apply the rules to as we did in the previous vote you had on this special permit application. So I suggest that all rules, all laws be enforced. And we're not going to pick and choose which ones we want to enforce and who we want to enforce them on. So I would suggest, highly suggest, that we make sure that these rules set forth by the governor are enforced. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Let's see what I have left here. Denise Forbes. Just unmute yourself, please. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Sorry about that. No Denise problem. Forbes, 325 North Plain Road. I'm just very disappointed that we sold out to Big Marijuana for 3% taxes. And I know how taxes are great for the city, but where does it go? We haven't seen our taxes on our properties go down. They've gone up which makes me very, very disappointed. Also, Theory Wellness had a mugging and crime has gone up a bit around there. Our town is turning to a pot town and everyone laughs at us because Lennox won't allow retail pot shops in their area and we're just out of control. So I really am very disappointed that you guys voted to go against the 200 buffer zone for Walter Mateague, which, hey, that's his business, not ours. And Great Barrington is going to suffer from it like California and Denver. You guys can go to Denver, Colorado. You haven't seen what the effects of all this marijuana does. But let me tell you, five years, years down the road, you won't be on the select board, but you're going to see the effects that it will do to this town. It's going to turn this town into a really horrible place. And I'm sorry to say it. I'm moving out as soon as I have an opportunity because I don't want to see it or be around it. It's very disheartening to know our town is turning into this. Number number uh, one town, small town in 2012. Well, you can forget that accolade. I'm really sorry, but that's how I feel. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Forbes. I see no other hands up. Absolutely. So, um, let me make sure everyone's muted. Uh, select board time, Lee. Thanks. Kate? Thank you. Bill? Uh, you're muted, Bill. I couldn't hear that. What was the question? Did you have select board time? Uh, no, nothing. Thank you. Ed? And nothing for me. Media time. Seeing nothing from the media, we are adjourned by unanimous consent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.